funding for Start the Beat is provided in part by our supporters on Patreon. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Start the Beat with Sykes. My name is Sykes and this is my podcast. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone who checked out the last episode. If you're one of those people, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and thanks so much for coming back. But for everyone out there who's new to the show, welcome. Feel free to make yourselves at home. And as always, there's beer, soda, water, coffee, or tea in the fridge. Cheers. Cheers, my friend. What do you got in that cheers, cup cheers. today? Is that a coffee? Oh, that's a coffee with a, a tea bag, tea bag, or a tea cup, tea bag, and a plate. I don't know if you can see if it's going to green screen it out. I saw it for like a second. Yeah. It's yeah. Get, okay. All right. Yeah. It's, it's getting we'll wild. Keep it, it's, yeah. Keep it moving. All right. Anyways, Cheers, I'm coffee. sitting here today with my friend, Giuseppe, make some noise for the internet. Holla, 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 holla. It's the boy. Thanks for doing technology. Happy Sunday, my friend. Happy Sunday. Oh, you know what? I just realized something. What's that? You're not. You're getting the the audio from the webcam. How do I sound now? Whoa. Worlds apart different. Yeah, does that sound a little bit better? Yeah. That's probably why you couldn't hear the... There we go. Yeah, All right. It's like, I didn't hear the beat, but now I hear the beat. Yeah, and also, when I introduced you, you had a clap. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. All right. Well, anyways, like I said, this is the new setup for 2021. It might not look different to people that watch the show, but behind the lens, there's a lot of different wiring and things going on. So, hi, Giuseppe. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Howdy and happy Sunday. Happy 2021, brother. Let's hope it's a little happier than the, the previous. Absolutely. So, so, so far, so far off, off to a good start, I feel, minus the traditional Pittsburgh weather. You know, I don't mind it. It's fine. I feel yeah, like I mean, you could tell... And some, I might, maybe I'm getting off this conversation on the wrong foot with some people that might be listening, but you know, I feel like you can tell the, the, the maturity and general responsibility of a human being by how much they complain about the weather. <laughs> it is a, it is a very like a uh, middle-class fancy rigs a dad conversation to have. But on the other side of the coin, you know, if you think about like seasonal affective disorder and stuff like that and how hard that can hit some people, that's a whole different conversation and can of worms you know this 2020 you know the tail end of 2020 at least for me i'm normally i normally don't really get seasonal affective disorder you know it affects my wife pretty heavily but it hit me pretty hard this year because i'm normally not like a sad doom and gloom kind of guy but like when we first started getting the, gr the gray towards the tail end of 2020 i was like oh i don't really feel like myself right now something's off and i couldn't really pinpoint it and i'm like oh it's gray and really shitty outside that could have a lot to do with it sure 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 i wonder too if it has to anything to do with like you know for anybody that doesn't know you you're you're uh you're a music maker you play the drums and other instruments in various projects which we will get into but this year is probably the most amount of time that perhaps you've spent in the gray in a while because you're normally on the road, right? Yeah. 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 This was the longest period of time that I'd been home in four years. That's fucking wild, man. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, what have you been doing with yourself this past year? Oh, man. Um, a lot of video gaming. <laughs> cool. A lot of video gaming. Uh, the stuff you see in the background of my video, uh, I started doing like some motion graphics animation stuff. Uh, that was actually something I started picking up uh, exactly a year ago in January. Um, kind of right now, this this beginning of this January is kind of a bittersweet thing for my wife and I because January of 2020, we were fortunate to spend the first week of January in Oslo, Norway. Uh, because of like uh, our traditional lines of work, you know, me touring you know, playing music with her uh, as a wedding photographer, the traditional times that people would normally take a vacation together. Um, we don't necessarily have that same schedule or leniency with scheduling. So whenever we take a vacation together, it normally has to be in like January, February, March, when most of our industries are kind of shut down or slower. So we can, you know, take a week or take two weeks, what, whatever the finances will allow, you know, for us to go and, you know, have ourselves a little adventure. Mm -hmm. So to think of that 
today, last year, you know, my wife and I were palling around the beautiful, beautiful city of Oslo, Norway. And that was her first time ever outside of the country out at, with the exception of Canada. You know, that was a really, really, really awesome experience. But I digress. Uh, a lot, so a lot of the stuff that I've been doing this past year, besides, you know, trying to trying to pivot like most creatives and trying to, you know, find other creative ways to stay busy and stay motivated. You know, that was a big thing that I struggled with this past year was like having the energy or the motivation to like really better myself, which for me, it was a really difficult thing to swallow because, you know, I have pretty bad ADHD. So I'm used to like, go, 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 you know, never stop moving. You know, I hate sitting around and being dormant. Um, but my hands were kind of tied this year. And for me to try and break, you know, break down my own walls of, you know, my, my brain to be like, yo, you know, get off your ass and just do something, you know, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Um, you know, starting to learn the ins and outs of uh, motion graphics animation was one thing that I'd put a lot of time into, you know, <laughs> hundreds of hours of YouTube tutorials, learning how uh, this software called Blender 3D works because it's free, it's open source. And, for, you know, for somebody like me, you know, sometimes, sometimes a well-paid artist and sometimes a starving artist, you know, I didn't exactly have the finances to be like, oh, I'm just going to go buy Cinema 4D outright, or I'm going to go, you know, like buy Maya or a ZBrush. And I was, I was always just curious as far as, you know, how, you know, making your own things in a 3D element worked, you know, making motion graphics, you know, making really cool models and, you know, landscapes and textures and stuff that move. So I discovered this program Blender and what uh, started following a bunch of dudes on YouTube that used Blender pr on a professional level for a lot of like motion graphics work and, you know, uh, uh, set, uh, set extension design, which is like when people use green screen and then implement, you know, different landscapes and stuff with the green screens to mix that in with actual footage. So I, I put an unhealthy amount of time into like learning how the ins and outs of that worked, at least at the base level. So I could do stuff like, uh, you're seeing on my video background just to start easing into that. Because my big thing is I just, I love, I love the arts, all things art, you know, whether it's music, uh, visual, um, all of it. There's, there's such a vast endless supply of ways to be creative. You know, I saw that you were working on some painting and sketching, uh, on your Instagram and yeah. it's like, it's awesome seeing, you know, artists really stretching themselves out to, you know, try many different mediums. And that's kind of my thing. You know, my mom was an art teacher, uh, primarily in ceramics, but, she, you know, she taught my brothers and I all to draw. She tried to teach us, you know, how to throw pottery on, on a, on a kick wheel and an electric wheel. I wasn't really good with, with ceramics. That wasn't exactly my strong suit. I really enjoyed uh, charcoals and pastels a lot when I was younger. I kind of fell out of that. Um, but a couple of years ago when I got an iPad pro and then an Apple pencil, you know, I really started messing around with some graphic design stuff and just sketching and procreate. And uh, some other, you know, iPad software just to kind of get back into using a pen and paper, even if it's in a digital medium. Um, and then about two years ago, I started taking this little uh, Zoom camera. It's a Zoom Q2N and started documenting some video footage and stuff on tour because I forgot, you know, how much cool stuff you see when you're on the road, you know, because before Prada picked me up, it had been shit five, six years since I had toured with Haste the Day. You know, so a lot of like the normal adventures of tour, you kind of forget about, you know, because I had assimilated myself into, you know, bartending culture here in Pittsburgh. And that was kind of my my pivot uh, whenever Haste the Day had had uh, uh, ended their legacy. And, you know, I had a couple a couple offers after Haste the Day to stay on the road, but, you know, nothing, nothing was quite lining up the way that I thought it should so I just decided to, you know, have like a hard pivot and um, get into bartending, yada, yada, yada. Um, so, yeah, I started documenting some video stuff on the road just as like a consumer hobbyist level, not professional yet. But, you know, I, I wanted to start somewhere and at least, you know, have some, you know, video memoirs of like all these cool experiences to see and stuff when I'm out there. But just being able to like have another form of art, you know, like capture these moments, you know, and then make cool intros like you know this weird 3d stuff you see in my background and learning how to overlay them together and work with them you know kind of similar to the stuff that you were doing with uh 
uh, Sykes and the New Violence live shows, how you had, you know, those backs, uh, the screens behind you guys with all the awesome projections and motion graphics going on during your shows. Like when I saw y'all at Howlers, rest in peace. Yeah. That like, I saw the video shit. I was like, dude, this is so sick. And like, it, that was, that was kind of the moment that I immediately knew it's like, all right, this dude Sykes is not fucking around. This is a guy that does his leg work, does the heavy lifting and executes it flawlessly. Not to suck, not to suck you off too hard, but big, big props and a lot of respect for that, man. Cause it's, it's awesome. Whenever you see somebody that has multiple talents, you know, bringing them all in under one roof and just letting everything flow. Thank you. I appreciate the kind words. That's really nice of you. With your background, you kind of answered some questions I was going to ask before you even gave me an opportunity to ask them. But it was just in terms... I was (laughs) was just going to say, like, I have a tendency to ramble, so please feel free to cut me off. Yo, yo, this is about you, not me. So talk all you want. But it didn't seem like you had much of a background in terms of uh, visual arts. Well, how how are your math and geometry skills... And how has that played into your 3D graphics? Zero. So I, I really have, I have no background in visual arts uh, on even a remotely professional level. Um, it was real, like really only in the past two years that I really start getting into like the bare bones basics of some light graphic design. And when I say graphic design from my end, I mean just like messing around on an iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil and hoping that it comes out cool. And hoping that someone's like, hey, that's really great. You know, like, how do you want to help me out? You know, make this flyer for, you know, this event I'm doing. Or, you know, maybe sketch out a little logo idea and see if it's something we might be able to use. You know, just stuff like that. Um, And just, you know, put in a little time here and there. Um, la- This January last year when I got home from Norway, you know, I put in an unhealthy amount of time learning about Blender 3D, you know, to the point where my 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 poor wife thought that there was something wrong with me because I was putting an unhealthy amount of time into watching YouTube tutorials. Do you, do you I was think, just trying. Go ahead. I was going to say, do you think that that's just kind of like that, like unhealthy creator thing? Like, were you like that with drums when you started playing? Yes. Yes. And I think part of that kind of stems, uh, stems from my ADHD. And I don't necessarily like look at that personally as a crutch or as a hindrance by any way, shape or form, but just more of like a, almost unhealthy drive to just want to force yourself to learn something as as expedient a manner as possible um for drums it wasn't like a hard focus like to the point where i'm agitating myself but it was more just like such a passionate love for being like you know i really want to learn this drum fill i really want to learn this beat i really want to continue to level up you know as i go excuse me because you're you're only young once You know, and I say that now as a 33 year old man who's lived a very unique life, but there's always room for constant growth and constant improvement, which is, you know, why I really love music and I love stuff like visual arts because no matter how good, you know, I personally think I am, there's always 3 million people out there that are just making me look like a total noob. And honestly, I love that. I don't look at that as a bad thing. I look at that as motivation because that just gives me people to look up to, to learn from, you know, that gives me mentors, that gives me teachers, and that just gives me more infinite resources to better myself at something. Yeah. With, you know, your background, I didn't honestly, I honestly didn't realize that you were 33. You're actually younger than me. I don't, but not Real? much. How, you're like, you're how old two, are you? I'm 35. So you're two years younger than me. Um, But we still came up in the same, like, scene of bands and everything and i was always i always felt like i was like a younger one like a lot of people that i know are older than me i've like constantly been the youngest person in a lot of my bands like i think i'm the youngest person in gray walker and i'm 35 but not by much i think evan might have me beat by like two weeks or something like that but i was gonna say because he he doesn't he doesn't even look that that's the the beauty of our crew is like you guys don't even i mean just an aside, he's got that great silver fox look going on, <laughs> and he he is a he is a strapping young old lad. He's got that he's got that George Clooney vibe on lock. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and not only is he a badass bassist, but good dudes too. You know, Evan. It's like it's awesome because I feel like you've surrounded yourself with you know some of the best of the best in our city with you know all the things that you're doing, and that's rad to you know have such a rad circle of people doing 
making big moves and being really, really good at their, their arts and their crafts. Um, but yeah, I, for me, like I was always the youngest too. So like, uh, back in, you know, p- uh, late high school, post high school days when I was, uh, with once nothing, I was the baby. Like they, everybody called me baby Joey. Like it's <laughs> everybody that, everybody that knows me prior to 2005 knows me as Joey. Cause that's what my parents called me growing up. My dad's an Italian immigrant born and raised in a little village in Calabria called San Donato de Nenea, which is essentially like four hours Southeast of Naples. Um, so, you know, my dad's Pasquale Antonio Capolupo, my older brother's Domenico Vincenzo Capolupo. I'm Giuseppe Antonio Capolupo, little brother's David Michael. Um, my mom's Irish. So naturally she wanted one boy that had a good old Irish name. <laughs> um, but they, my parents called my older brother Vince um, and they called me Joey. So I didn't actually legally start, you know, signing, you know, school paperwork and things as Giuseppe to like my junior year in high school. Uh, so when I graduated in 2005, you know, when I'd meet new people, I started introducing myself as Giuseppe. So anybody that knows me pr- uh, prior to, you know, my coming of age tale, if you will, knows me as Joey. So all the ones, nothing boys called me baby Joey. Cause I, I literally was a kid when I first started toying with him. My dad was, uh, now retired was a civil attorney. He actually made, uh, Josh Brannis and Dave Burks sign a legal document that said they were acting as my guardians to be able to legally take me <laughs> as a 17 year old across state borders when we were touring. That's so gnarly, but I yeah. guess a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my my dad naturally didn't agree with you know the music the music lifestyle post high school. You know, he wanted me to go to school, get a degree, and you know, attempt the American dream. Which it took us a good couple years of a little bit of slight turmoil and disagreements before he finally was like, you know, you're your own man. You're going to do it your way. You know, I can't not love you for that. He's like, you know, I did it my way. Um. He's like, you are your father's son. You're stubborn. You're going you're yeah. gonna to figure it out. Well, I think that that's, you know, wouldn't that be the American dream? You know, uh, just doing it your way and, yeah, you know, chasing was- your dreams, being in a country that's free enough that allows you to go play drums and, you know, pay bills and buy burritos because that's about all we're doing. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I mean, granted, man, like. You know, it wasn't, it really wasn't until I was with Haste the Day where I actually started getting paid to play music. Fair enough. You know, so it was, a, it was a lot of, it was a lot of struggle and a lot of, you know, young, young, like not taking no for an answer kind of mentality. I'm like, I'm not going to stop. You know, you know, I can't, I can't stop till I've fully scratched that itch just to make sure that I've really exhausted my passion for it before, you know, I pivot. And, fa- and found like another passion to chase after if the music industry didn't work out for me. Yeah, I think that um, it's a natural misunderstanding, but a misunderstanding nonetheless that I think a lot of people that are younger in the music scene, whether not necessarily age, but just the time spent in the music community, um, yeah. there's like this romantic, like romanticizing of like a life in the music industry and like how much work it doesn't take but it does take a lot more work than a lot of people realize. And I think that that's what tends to, you know, keep a lot of people from crossing that, that threshold and taking that step. So what was it like for you, you know, when you were maybe just first starting to realize like, Oh, like I'm in this band and I'm touring and things are good and I'm making money, but like maybe this isn't going to last forever. Or maybe this isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. What was like some of that shit like for you the first time you were dealing with those feelings? If you ever dealt with them, I, I mean, can't imagine you didn't. No, I, I did. I mean, a lot of a lot of people go through it. Um, when I when I first joined Haste the Day in two thousand nine as a contractor, as you know, a hired a hired gun drummer, you know, the first thing that Jimmy Ryan, the original vocalist, said to me when he, uh, when he was working as an A and R rep for Tooth and Nail, he said, "Don't find your identity in the band." You know, because I feel like that's a problem that a lot of older musicians have is when you've done something for such a long time, you find, that's your identity now. You mm-hmm. don't have an identity outside of that. You can't remove yourself from that. And after all this time of not touring and then Prada picking me up, you know, to be their, their guy, 
at, that was a time that I needed to understand like, oh, this is all fleeting. This is stuff that isn't going to last forever. You know, it's important to not rely on on that as your source of, you know, infinite happiness or have all the answers for you, you know, emotionally and financially, because it's feast or famine. And like the feelings of, you know, trying to have that, you know, self-aggrandizing validation of like, oh, I'm this person from this band. You're not, because when you go home, you're still, you know, this normal person. You know, when I come home from a tour with Prada, you know, I'm still just Giuseppe from Pittsburgh, you know, grew up on a horse ranch back in the South Hills, you know, happily married to an awesome wife with two dogs. Um, it's, you know, I'm a, a normal normal, I would still consider myself blue collar, you know, working class dude, you know, I, t- I have to tend bar whenever I'm not on tour, just to make sure that there's still a little bit of money coming in. Sure. Because, you know, because while in the music industry, you know, even as a contractor, you know, with, uh, I would, I would consider them a bigger metal core act, you know, that wears Prada, you know, there, there'll be a year where, you know, financially I crush it. And then there'll be a, a year where it's like, all right, you know, I'm going to have to pick up a couple extra bar shifts this week if I can get them. Cause you know, I'm not bringing a lot of money with the band because we're not working. Cause I'm only, I'm only getting paid with them when we're working, you know, when we're in the studio, when we're on tour, because I'm still paid out as a contractor. Um, which, you know, it's awesome. I like it that way just because it's a, it's a guaranteed number for me. And I've known those guys for such a long time as pals now, just from the other bands that I've played with that, you know, I was one of their first calls whenever Danny left the band and they needed a guy to learn 14 songs, figure out some parts for, and go to track their second to last record transit blues. So I was like, Oh, I don't know if I have the chops to play this stuff anymore, but send me the music real quick. I'll go to my rehearsal space, see what I come up with. If, and if I can even physically handle it, then I'll call you back. Um, thankfully I was able to deliver, but I, I had some doubts. Uh, but there is, there is a lot of you know emotional turmoil over my music career, just with like the acceptance of it, not lasting forever. You know, I had put in my entire life, behind the drum kit you know in the band room back in high school just beating beating around on the kit to stuff that you know our music director would put on the put on the pa system in the band room you know i'd spend my lunch breaks there you know i'd try to get in there for home room and just be messing around on the kit because i couldn't get my brain off the drum kit it just that's where i always envisioned myself since i was in you know middle school middle school is where i really started taking you know drumming seriously um but, you know, as I got older and was able to, you know, see a good chunk of the world playing music, you know, I realized, like, I know this isn't going to last forever. So I have to, you know, make sure I savor these moments now while I have them and make these awesome memories. Because whenever it is time for, the, you know, me being on tour to not be a thing, I'm mentally prepared for that and, you know, mentally comfortable and willing to accept that. Mm-hmm. And I think now at 33 years old, you know, let's say let's say Prada, you know, tours another two, maybe three years, whatever. And then, you know, they decide to, you know, let it, let it rest. You know, like if the right opportunity came along after that, you know, maybe I would say yes to staying on the road, but maybe I'd be comfortable exploring what else is out there as far as, you know, whatever the next step is. But I'm a firm believer in you are where you're supposed to be. Sure. Granted, Granted, the choices that you make have a lot to do with that, you know, during your journey, but to, to think that there is this entire world of creative things like 3D motion, graphic animation, and, you know, audio production and, you know, making podcasts, having a Twitch stream, you know, being a videographer, being a professional photographer. There's so many incredible mediums for, uh, for us artists out there where it's like, why limit yourself to just one of them? Sure. I think that there's, you know, there's so much more to life than music or your art. And I think it's like really hard for some people to combat that. And, you know, I'm in this place where like, you know, I haven't had, you know, I really, I haven't ever had a music project that worked, you know, they're all fun and I love them all to death, but for whatever the universe has just decided that, you know, you are who you are and you're going to be in this place. And I've done a lot of cool things with a lot of cool people and I've built a really cool life for, for myself. You know, everybody that I know, 
in my life is from the music scene. So I'm very grateful for everything that I've had and just being able to just like, well, I'm 35 now and I don't know if anything's ever going to take off in a way that I would maybe hope, especially now given the current state of the world. I don't fucking know. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I better just make sure I'm spending every day at least happy that I'm doing what I am doing and I'm able to have the friends that I have and I'm able to keep a roof over my head and I still have, you know, I still work in the music industry technically and I pay my bills and blah, blah, blah. And I have fun and life should just be fun. So yeah, I don't know. Amen. It's like, amen to that, dude. It, but like, you know, it, it does like kind of suck sometimes though. I think still like coming to that realization, it's like, Oh, like, you know, one day this is going to end and what else am I going to do? I mean, I don't know. So I guess I'm just going to do 10,000 different things and wear too many hats. So if one falls off, I won't really notice it or miss it that yeah. much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's all. That's always, that's always been a very similar rule of mine is like, make sure you have a card in every deck. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? It's jack of all trades, master of some. Sure. I won't say ma- I won't say master of none. You know, because there's certain things you put all this work into where, you know, I would consider yourself to have like a certain level of mastery in some things. You know, like when I first saw like the video wall stuff you're doing with Sykes, I'm like, that's a dude who put in some work to make that shit happen, especially in a live setting, because you know how first and foremost, how difficult that is to wire up and program and map out, you know, and program that to the click track and, you know, make sure that the animations are lining up on the screens. Like there's so many finite details that go into that and, you know, hours of learning how to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, I you think- know so going back to what, going back, to, go ahead. Oh, uh, you go. I know. I was just going to say like, going back to what you were saying about um, how younger artists you know, have this vision of what it's like being in the music industry and how like little work it could be. No, it's an insane amount of work. You, you sacrifice a lot to do it. And I think that's the thing. A lot of younger musicians that, you know, fantasize about, you know, being a prof, like a career musician or session player, or, you know, like career artist, you know, they fantasize about, it's like you sacrifice so much to do it. You know, you sacrifice financial security, you know, sometimes you sacrifice relationships, you know, you, you miss birthdays, you miss weddings, you know, like there have been some instances where people have missed funerals because, you know, they're on tour or they're on a gig. Mm -hmm. And it's like, those aren't things you don't think of that you're signing up for whenever you do it, you know, like they're on a heavy tour year, you know, I'm gone away from home five to six months, you know, from my wife and my dogs and the comfort of my house. And, you know, where, where I do have ADHD and I love constantly moving, constantly shaking, you know, like there's not a second that goes by where I don't miss my wife and I don't miss my dogs and I don't miss the comfort of my own bed, raiding my own refrigerator for snacks at two (laughs) o'clock in the morning. You know, the normal luxuries, these little things that, you know, when I was younger, I took for granted because I'm like, oh, this big wide world that I get to go explore and play music for people that if they care to come and see, you know, what, what we're doing. Um, there are things that a lot of people don't think of, you know, when they, they sign up for the music industry and learning those lessons on at an early age. I'm glad I learned, I learned them when I was younger because now I have a little tiny bit of wisdom, you know, at 33 years old, having experienced all that firsthand. Um, but once again, I wouldn't be able to do that if it weren't for the amazing support structure that I have here at home. You know, my wife's an incredible woman who's super supportive of what I do, even though she doesn't like the heavy music as much as I do. You know, she's still, you know, she still supports, she still comes to shows and will snap some photos and, you know, that my bandmates love her. She loves my bandmates. It's, it's a really cool dynamic and um, wouldn't be able to live that lifestyle if, you know, my wife wasn't supportive of it. Absolutely. Oh, sure. Absolutely not. You know, one of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of that, uh, whoops, I messed up. I messed up again. Where did you go? Where are we at? Oh my gosh. Oh Lord. I am having quite a field day today with all this new stuff. And what I was thinking is that it's not too dissimilar from any new trade that you pick up. And I think, you know, people think playing in a band I'm just going to play music and it's going to be cool. It's probably not too dissimilar from, you know, how it's easy to romanticize being a bartender, which you mentioned you got into where it's like, oh, okay, I could be that guy behind the bar, mixing the stuff, 
doing the thing, talking to people, getting some money, and it's cool. But like, it's okay. Well, you know, if you don't have somebody behind the bar with you, well, you're also cleaning the glasses. You also have to learn how to make everything. You have to learn how to deal with, you know, a whole room full of people. You got to learn how to keep things in your brain and how to work oh, yeah. under pressure. And all that stuff kind of comes into being in a van too. It's like, well, you got to learn the songs. You got to know stuff on the fly. You got to be able to be there on time and be reliable and work under pressure. And I think that those are the things that crack a lot of people because it's not just like sex, drugs, and always, rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not always fun. No, no, it's not. A it's lot not of, always fun. Yeah. A, a lot of time tour isn't fun. I think there's that, you know, tour is a vacation sort of thing that, that myth that a lot of people have. Yeah. And, and it can be, sure. you know, but it, even, so let me, let me walk you through like a day to day of what it looks like, uh, for me, uh, being on tour, you know, at, well, 32 years old. Cause I was 32 the last time I was on tour now. Thanks COVID. Um, so I'm, I'm known as being a little bit of a narcolept when it comes to being on tour. There've been many, many times where I've fallen asleep in the front lounge of the bus or, uh, the bandwagon or, you know, in the green room or just random places when it's nighttime past, uh, you know, after the, after the show has taken place and everybody's hanging out, you know, they'll be kicking it full volume in the front lounge of whatever vehicle we're in, you know, having a couple pints, you know, celebrating the, a, a good day's work. And there was one video in particular, our guitarist Kyle got where I'm sitting there on the couch, like sitting upright like this, arms crossed on the couch, sleeping, upright out cold it's like probably 11 30 midnight and they want to see how many hats they could put on my head <laughs> without waking me up uh -huh. there must have been like 10 or 11 hats on my head and i'm just still snoring up a storm they were able to take them all right back off me without me moving an inch wow so with that with that little precursor known uh, my normal day to day like uh the next morning i'll wake up probably somewhere between like eight or nine um considering I'm always one of the first ones to fall asleep unwillingly where they have to like wake me up to be like, dude, go to your bunk. Like it, you're, you're out cold, you know, you're taking up a seat where somebody could be sitting and kicking it, not in a mean way, but they're <laughs> like, you're asleep, just go to bed. I'm like, okay. So once they were asking me to bed, I'll wake up around eight or nine the next morning. You know, if it's a longer drive, we're, we'll still be driving fix myself a coffee. Um, you know, if we get to the venue, first thing I do is, you know, scout out a uh, place, you know, for a bite to eat. Then it'll be load in time, you know, then depending on the bill, uh, when do we sound check, et cetera, et cetera. We use this app called master tour, which has like the itinerary outlined. Um, and the tour manager makes printouts the night before that are all over the vehicle, as well as the venue the next day of like what the itinerary is, sound check, load in doors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so after sound check, then it's like, okay, well, now we have however much time you wish to kill. Now, depending on the city that we're in, you know, what I try to do is, you know, reconnect with some friends, you know, maybe go grab a bite to eat with them. That's like the cool part that I, th I think about tour is I get to see people a lot more frequently that I normally wouldn't get to see. So I have some close pals in a lot of different cities where it's like, you know, I know for a fact that I get to see this person, you know, once or twice a year, depending on the tour routing. So, you know, I try to make it a point to uh, connect with old pals, you know, even if it's for a couple hours just to go grab a bite to eat, even if they can't make it to the show, you know, it's nice to now have friends in a bunch of different cities that normally, you know, I'd, uh, you'd be lucky to be able to see them or hang out with them, you know, once every two years, just because, you know, getting time off of work, et cetera, et cetera, trying to schedule, you know, time to go spend with these people that you've known for a long time. So the convenience of tour is like, oh, I get to see all these people that I care about that I normally would never get to see because, you know, work can get crazy or, you know, their, maybe their lives and work lives can get a little crazy. Uh, and then it's showtime. So normally with Prada, um, we'll do like a little warm up. Um, you know, I have this little practice pad kit set up. So we'll go in the green room, you know, just unplugged. Uh, I'll just put the click track in my ear to keep time for everybody. And we'll just do like a quick run through of a couple of the tracks just to get the limbs, you know, stretched out, you know, a little bit loose before playing the show. Uh, then, you know, after that, you know, I'll do a couple stretches, make sure my arms and legs are as loose as possible, because let's be real, I am not getting any fucking younger <laughs> <laughs> and playing metalcore as a drummer is a very physically grueling thing. It's like, I am, 
a very small human. I am five, four. I'm like barely 120 pounds. Like I'm a little dude. I'm a little dude. I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, I still fit into, you know, a 28, 30 jean. And I just, as of like two years ago, started kind of filling out an adult small t-shirt. So go me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, naturally playing metal core for me, my body takes a beating. Um, you know, granted the little meat that is on my body is muscle, but that's because of the drumming. Honestly, you know, I try to you know, do a, a couple gym days a week when we're on tour just to make sure I'm staying in peak physical shape because it's physically grueling. Um, you know, I have one of those little smartwatch things from Samsung. It tells me how many calories I average, I burn on average during a show. It's like well over 2,800 calories a day when I'm on tour. Wow. I don't even really consume that much calories when I'm on tour. But yeah. I mean, when I'm on tour, I, I have to because... You know, my, my little muscles are just firing on all pistons at all times, you know, from if it's a, an, off, an off day and, you know, I'm hitting a treadmill for a little bit just to get the cardio or, you know, trying to be a strong man, lift a couple of weights, but like, it's very physically grueling and mentally as well, because you know, you're away from home, you know, whereas my wife and I are both very independent people where it's like, we're, we're okay being by, being by ourselves. You know, she's she always jokes around and says she loves having the space in bed because we have two dogs that love to sleep <laughs> with us most of the time. And Cece, our golden retriever, has a tendency to take up almost all of the bed and leave very little space for my wife and I, as much as we love her so dearly. Um, but so my my wife likes having the bed to herself when I'm on tour, uh, and that's something she always she always jokes about when she's like, "Oh, you know, my husband's supposed to be on tour this year, but instead, you know, he's." living all of his ADHD tendencies here for me to enjoy. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it's, it's, a uh, it, it is very physically and mentally challenging to be on tour. Whereas I have a lot of fun on tour. Not everybody has a lot of fun on tour. You know, for some people it is still work, you know, in, in the lives of a tour manager or, you know, like the front of house engineer or a tech, um, you know, even some band members, you know, it can be very, a very grueling time, you know, because when you get to your, I won't say 33 is old by any way, shape or form, but when you get to like this age, after you've been doing it for such a long time, you know, it can be a lot of work. You know, there are days where, you know, some of the Prada guys, you know, are having a tough time being on the road, you know, because that's all a lot of them have known for their entire lives. They've been touring since they were teenagers. Yeah. You know, on a professional, on a professional level, which is a wild thing to think about. Cause at least for me, you know, I got a good five year break in there to like, see what home life is about, you know, being a bartender and exploring, you know, a different field. But for them, it's just been go, 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 go. I think one of the, but everybody go ahead. I was just going to say, I think a benefit to that though, would be, you know, you're working with what seems to be like a really professional team of people that like aren't interested in really fucking around and just kind of want to get the job done. Oh, yeah. And I think that you probably yeah. have fun on the road because you just seem like somebody that likes work like you. And like, if yeah. you, if you come home and decide to spend any time being a bartender, you have to like work or just be a total psychopath yeah. to want to be in that line of work. You have to like enjoy I mean, the I, hustle. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, for, probably for me, like I grew up on a horse. I grew up on a horse ranch back in the South Hills. So not only did I have my normal chores as your average, you know, suburban kid, because which that was a weird thing is our, our farm was a little 19 point acre, five, 19.5 acre plot in the South Hills, which isn't known as farmland. It's known as suburbia. Um, but, you know, before school, you have to go let the horses out to pasture uh, throw some hay in their stalls, make sure they had water. Uh, and then, you know, my brothers and I would go to school. My parents would finish up from there, come home. You know, we'd have to, if we were working with, working with some of the horses, you know, training, turn them out to corral, you know, do a couple laps with them, you know, on a lead, you know, because some of them were saddle breaking. You know, some of these were wild horses that we rescued that from Utah and Nevada, when we rescued them from auction, and we're now training these horses to be able to interact with humans. So we, by the time they would get to our ranch, we're only the second or third batch of humans these horses have really ever seen. Um, so outside of my normal suburban kid chores, you know, we've, we had farm animals to take care of and train. 
I had to bale hay in the summer times. We had to clean stalls in the winter times. So like it's a lot of work ethic tried to instill at a very young age uh, from two parents who were both leaders uh, of my brothers and I, you know, my mom wasn't a, like a stay at home mom. You know, she, she's a tough cookie. You know, she was raised by an ex Marine ex FBI agent, you know, my grandpa. Maybe wow. that's piece. So, and she was one of 11. Wow. So like naturally they were all taught hand to hand combat. They were all self-sufficient. They're all tougher than nails. Uh, and then my dad, same thing. You know, my dad grew up in Southern Italy and came over via Ellis Island by boat. Like, so they both have these very unique stories and try to instill a lot of that work ethic and a lot of those same values with my brothers and I. Most most of it stuck. Some things didn't because, so, you know, different gen different yeah. generations. But when I come home from tour, I can't just sit still. You know, I can't sit still, you know, either financially, physically, mentally, like I'm used to the go, 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 go. So I have to have things to keep me busy and keep me occupied. And also the community of like the service industry here in Pittsburgh is very similar to how, you know, the community of, you know, musicians, touring musicians, touring personnel is. It's very tight knit. Absolutely. Now, going back to you starting to really get into playing music and touring and just being around people in the independent music community, not all our particular genre that we ex have existed in, you know, for half of our lives now at this point isn't always filled with like the most responsible, mature work ethic driven people. You know, there's a lot of fuck ups in our community. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what was it like being around these people growing up around these people and like maybe, you know, even being tempted to maybe lose some sight of like responsibility and good work ethic and just kind of go and fuck off. What was it like for you? You've always seemed to be like reasonably grounded. Like you didn't really let it get to you, but I'm sure you were around it. And what was that like? I mean, I was around it and I wasn't always, you know, this like wise young squire, so to speak. You know, when I was a teenager, I still was a fucking idiot. You know, like I wasn't the brightest crayon in the box. I was just motivated to the point where I just didn't want to stop playing music. You know, that was my only really driving factor was I'm like, I have to prove it to myself that, you know, being a career musician can be done, you know, not to spite my parents, you know, because naturally my dad didn't agree with it. Um but I, I just needed to prove to myself that it was possible. That was, that was really it. You know, it was difficult, you know, being an impressionable teenager, being around that kind of shit. Cause yeah, there were times where I did step out of line, you know, maybe, you know, I was like 16 and was like, Oh, well, I don't really know this girl, but we're going to hang out. Or, you know, maybe I don't smoke pot, but maybe I'm going to smoke pot with these guys, you know, like yeah. there's, it, it's a, your standard coming of age tales, like trying to figure things out for yourself. You know, I tried to like utilize a lot of the, you know, lessons my parents taught me and my brothers as a kid to be like, dude, just be smart. Use your head. Don't be an idiot. You know, and so, m most of the times I did adhere to the, you know, that moral compass, you know, sometimes I didn't when I was younger, mm -hmm. you know, but very quickly when you're, when you start touring, you figure out very quickly, like that you have to have your head screwed on straight because that industry can eat you the fuck alive if you let it and it can ruin you. I've watched it take like good people and turn them sour because they got too carried away. And, you know, like the sex drugs, rock and roll that Hollywood portray, or, you know, they get too caught up in the fame and like being the constant center of attention, but it having a home life is such an integral part to being able to come back to normal when tour is over. Yeah. Because touring is up. Touring is abnormal at at like the smallest increment in like just scratching the surface. It's in a very abnormal job. Like it has weird hours. Sometimes you're in pla strange places of the world you never in a million years thought you would ever visit. You know, like I was in Russia la like la uh, November of 2019. Like, did I ever think I was going to go to Russia? Fuck no. Was it an incredible experience? And can I not wait to go back there? Oh, I'll, I'd go back post COVID I'd go back tomorrow. You know, if this virus wasn't a thing, you know, if the band's like, Hey, we're going back to play Russia. I'd be like, yes, let's go. Because it was such an incredible experience. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's just a roller coaster, man. It has its, it has its pros and cons, but like going back to, you know, young musicians fantasizing about the music industry, 
all of the things that Hollywood portrays as far as the music industry, the fame, the glory, the drugs, girls, all that stuff is, is there. You just have to choose what your path is. What do you, what are you trying to get out of it? For me, I just want to play music for people that are kind enough to spend their hard earned money to come and listen. And I want to do that with a passionate group of people that believe in the music just as much as I do and care enough about their craft to make all those sacrifices that it takes being an artist to go do that. That was all I wanted. And I've been fortunate through my career as a drummer to be able to group up with people like that. So the guys in wants nothing, you know, still to this day are some of my closest friends. You know, I, I still consider them family. Haste the day, same thing. I consider them family because you experience these little increments of life together that bond you for forever. Like they're, you you watch each other grow up and you grow up with each other in these very unique circumstances that tour life presents that no matter how much you try to like mentally shake it or you know sometimes you forget about it you're always reminded like that one time you know in the sandy beaches of uh mobile alabama we're stranded for a couple of days because one of the shows got canceled you know and you're still connecting with promoters through myspace mm-hmm. Um, in the early days, you know, maybe you're calling the promoter from a pay phone after booking shows on fear.com or like all these old school message boards before social media was really a thing, you know, watching all of these growths take place throughout the years. Like, I wish I was driven enough to like write a memoir just about like an anonymous, um, person existing in the music industry from like the mid two thousands to current day. Um, ADHD won't let me do that because I I have a hard time reading books from, (laughs) from the get go period. I'll make it like two chapters and be like squirrel. Uh Um, But (sighs) I digress. You were talking about uh, being around all that stuff as Mm -hmm. like a young kid. Um, All the, I was fortunate enough, like the guys that I was in band with, like they're all straight shooting dudes. You know, like with ha- with Haze the Day, like this is very strictly a Christian metalcore band, you know, so even that was a world that I wasn't really all that familiar with. You know, I was born and raised Roman Catholic, not that I necessarily agree with a lot of the Catholic Church's teachings these days, but I still respect, you know, the devout nature of my parents' religion and those that, that still follow uh, all of that. Um, but for me, you know, being with Haze the Day initially was a very... Uh, eye-opening experience and a large learning curve because I'm not, I wasn't at the time when haste picked me up known for my tact and to how I felt about things. I very, very much wore my heart on my sleeve because, you know, I was still pretty young and didn't really have a grasp on my shit just yet. You know what I mean? So when they, uh, um, so when they picked me up, I was learning how to exist with all these guys that, are undoubtedly Christian in a very Christian setting where I, at the time when Hayes picked me up, wasn't a good Christian, we'll say. Okay. (laughs) You know, I think that, you know, one of the things that a lot of, uh, young, younger bands, again, going into this sort of conversation, just trying to get your foot into the music industry in a way that's working. I think a thing that a lot of people overlook is like the power of not necessarily like the teamwork of the band, because that's super important, but like having a team outside of the band that help you fucking manage shit. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, a lot of times it's not even so much like in away like it doesn't really matter like i mean of course the songs need to be good and you have to have your shit together but i feel like with the right team you can like get any pile of shit out there and operating if you have the right team behind you because i've definitely seen that plenty of times oh yeah you know oh yeah like i lucked i lucked out with prada because you know they're already an established act when they pick me up so they already have you know the label support they already have management team even though like right when I joined, they were switching managers. So that was like something that they were dealing with on their end. Cause like, I never, I didn't really peek behind the curtain that much when I first jumped in with them. Cause I'm like, yo, I need to like 
try and remember tour etiquette and like how to exist with a band. Cause like, even though I know some of the members of this band, some of these guys are newer that don't really know me that well. And I don't know these guys. So it was like a, it was a huge learning experience, but seeing them operate as like a well-oiled machine at like a professional level, I'm like, dude, this is nuts. Like watching the, like seeing in the email chains, like roll out plans for like releasing a single or like planning a music video shoot or like any of this stuff. I'm like, I don't have to do shit besides show up yeah, and just do my, do my job, which honestly, in the grand scheme of things, is a very minute thing. Like their, uh, their day-to-day operations manager, Jackie Anderson, she's with, uh, um, uh, good fight management out of LA. Um, so they've also got, you know, they've got every time I die, um, and a bunch of other like artists that like I love. So I'm already like, yo, this is so cool. We're in the same family as these guys. What, yeah. what, how the fuck did I get here? <laughs> um, and we're booked by, um, her husband, Matt Anderson and Dave Shapiro at uh, sound talent. I think it's a sound talent agency. Um, and Dave Shapiro had been, you know, Prada's agent since like the bare beginnings. And, you know, he's, he's been, he's had one crazy career for himself and is now one of, you know, the most reputable agents in the industry. And it's funny because Mike always jokes around. It's like, why is he still with our small time metalcore band when he has, he's got like seven of his or four, he's got an absurd number of like his own airplanes, wow. that, like private airplanes that he, he pilots like the dude's a, a flight instructor now like the dude's lived a very unique life so just i digress yet again the coffee's starting to kick in <laughs> but watching but watching all these pieces of the puzzle at that level like operate to get stuff done it makes my head spin because once again you know when i was younger those are things you don't envision but going back to what you're saying about having all these people outside of the band on your team making stuff like getting stuff done like I now can't picture a band succeeding without that. Oh. Yeah, like having a having a DIY, you know, mentality and attitude is so important to be able to like take that next step. But when it comes to, you know, booking booking shows, like you understand first and foremost just as well as I do like how difficult it, it is to put on your own event. Dude. You know, to Dude. to be the center to be the center, to be that, that nucleus yeah. to like make all that shit happen to, you know, like, uh, working on the guarantee or is it a door deal, uh, a catering budget, you know, are you getting, are you getting free drink tickets? Uh, are, is the venue feeding you? What time are doors, uh, ticket sales, all of these little things where it's like you essentially have to act as your own agent, your own management and your own promoter yeah dude it's ridiculous like when we're and, fucking playing shows with well sex and new violence or normal creatures now whatever we want to call it whenever normal creatures gets to play a show it's like you know i'm booking the show i am loading in i am the light tech the projector tech audio and i have to perform and make sure all this shit's running i'm setting it up i'm tearing it down it's way too fucking much I love doing it. I love that I can do it, but holy shit. I know that if like I had two or three or me running around, like things could actually work. Cause at the end of the day, it's impossible to make it grow when it's just me. Cause I'm just like totally spaced out. I can't yeah. fucking well, focus. That's so many. Yeah. Well, there's so, that's so many elements for one person to yeah. have lined up. It's like, that's so much. That yeah, it's so it, it's like, so fucking much, dude. And like and like you know, as any sort of a DIY band, right? Like you know, it's like you know, it's hard to ask people or get people that are reliable that will just want to do stuff, you know, pro bono out of the kindness of their own heart. Like who's yeah. gonna? Who am I gonna find that's just gonna come and show up and set up all my projector shit? and do it right that I could trust that I'm not going to have to pay. Not that I don't want to pay or think that they deserve to be paid, but we're not getting paid. So how am I going to pay anybody? So how do you yeah. get to that level? You know, but the it's like, you know, how do I get to that level without the team and how do I afford the team without being at that level? I guess that's why it's kind of like it doesn't work for everybody really is because some people luck out. Some people have the circumstances where they're able to pull it off and it works for them. And that's, it just is what it is, man. I don't yeah. Know. But also I think it's like getting people to believe you like you believe you. Yeah. You know, and it's weird. Cause like that sounds super fucking ambiguous, um, which I guess it is, you know, it can be, that can be a, 
taken in any different kind of light. Um, so let's say like, uh, so this past May, I released just a three song, you know, like kind of lo-fi chill beats EP on Spotify. One of my friends, and he actually, he worked for, worked for uh, Prada for a long time. You know, it was like a tech merch guy. Um, he's, he's been with him for a minute. His name's Eric Fain. He runs just like a small, uh, a small label out of Kansas City just simply f- to release his friend's music. Uh, and I, I hit him up. I was like, Hey, you know, like if I finish this EP, would you want to release it just so I can, you know, put something online and say, I did something in, in 2020 productive. And he's like, dude, I'd be honored. So he released it on Spotify for me and helped set, help me set all that stuff up. Um, but you know, for me, I didn't release it to like get a shit ton of people to listen to it or, you know, get any fame or fortune or glory from it. It was just me wanting to achieve something and say like, I actually like I did this on my own accord, you know, with my own timeline. And I said, I'm going to do this. And I did it without a team behind it, with the exception of my friend, Eric, um, you know, helping me to to get it out there and get it into the ears of those who gave a shit to listen, which whoever did. Thank you. Um, But in attributing to, you know, if you believe in you believe in your stuff, convincing other people to believe in it as well. A lot of that has to do with the constant, the, the current digital age we live in. You know, a lot of uh, uh, some of the guys in in Prada talked about it a good bit as far as like following hip hop artists and the stuff that they're doing, like constant content coming out, constant content, almost like a bombardment of content because the attention span of a lot of the younger generation these days is so fucking short where you have to constantly be throwing stuff at them just to see what sticks. It's like, okay, let's release a 30 song album or a 30 song mixtape, release a whole damn thing. And I don't expect everybody to listen to the whole thing. But if that one person finds that one song out of those 30, that's their jam of the year. Boom. You've got them hooked. Yeah. Yeah. So I always thought that that was a very unique approach to it. Um, but how do you convince millions of people to believe in something that could just be like a little spark of imagination for you as an artist? How do you convince a world that stares at their phone for 14, 15, 16 hours a fucking day to pay attention to something you're passionate about. You know, that's kind of a rhetorical question and kind of an open-ended question because the formula is not the same for everybody. You know, maybe you're a crazy content designer that does like 3D graphics and like all this wild stuff on like a next level and then write killer music that goes on top of the animation or makes the animation to killer music or you make a killer music video or you release this album that's, you know, gonna be the the rumors to your Fleetwood Mac <laughs> that's just like your be all end all it, it's ultimately just everybody's gonna ha- gonna formulate their own opinion about it you know there's there's no right or wrong way to go about creating art right now and honestly like I think that's a beautiful place to be but also kind of scary if it's something where you're looking at it as like a career yeah because you know, because like lo- look at just look at the music industry right now, period. Like none of us know when we're going to be able to get back to, to like work full time in any capacity. Some people are saying, you know, maybe next summer, maybe next fall. Um, and I don't want to talk about the virus bullshit because that's, it's here. It's a thing. It's just a part of life. You know, it's nothing new now. Um, but that's just like the reality of it is there's just so much uncertainty in all of our industries right now, you know, as a bartender, like even all my side hustles took a hit. So this year has been trying to pivot, find more creative ways to, you know, monetize my art and, you know, monetize my work ethic and try and find people that require my services, whatever that may be to be like, yo, like hire me to like work on this project with you or hire me to like do this, this little like handiwork for you, whatever. Cause like, I promise that I'm a good investment in your time. Just like, take my word for it. I'll get you references. I just want to prove myself. Give me the opportunity to prove myself. And I feel like as an artist in a digital age, it's just about proving yourself. Yeah. Because like everybody's so hungry for content all the time, you know, with TikTok and all these like short little viral things happening. It's like back when, uh, vine first became, you remember when vine was still happening when that was a thing. Yeah. It was like, it's, 
it's that all over again. You know, it's just these short little clips that everybody's vying for your attention. So not only are you as an artist trying to vie for that same attention, you're battling against these people who just want to get their video viral for doing this cool dance, wearing a Velociraptor inflatable suit or something, you know, like it's, yeah, it's like, it's all, oh, there's like a large majority of the population that has like re assimilated, like what their need for music or like visual art, where it's all become this weird amalgamation because it's all being delivered through these very dense broad channels like a Facebook or a TikTok or an Instagram where it's like there isn't just a place for like people that want to go to and just listen to music for them to go like that's a social media platform that works like there is some elements of Bandcamp that has like you can create an account and leave comments but it's not like a social network Spotify yeah. isn't a social network Sa these SoundCloud these places aren't social networks right the, the only people that try to network on those platforms are other musicians really and you know, we don't really have anything. So all of a sudden, you know, your beat tape that you made is sandwiched in between like a Pepsi ad that's getting thrown at them. And then like, you know, a sandwich that their best friend had. And then like, you know, a picture of a dog, which is cool. Like sandwiches and dogs and all, all that shit's tight. But how can you expect people to like pay attention to like this art? It's like, you know, I spent a year working on these songs and we put them out and I'm just hoping that somebody will give one of them 30 seconds of their time that they'll want to keep listening to it. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, it's really easy to get distracted because you have me and like, I'm not necessarily like, you know, a gem to look at. And then you have like, you know, some young, attractive girl or boy dancing or doing some crazy cool looking thing. It's like, well, of course everybody's going to look at that. Who wants to look at me rapping right now? You know what I mean? I'm just like, the white dude in his thirties rapping. Like it's really not my time in the spotlight to be putting out this sort of content. I'm just not what people are interested in. And it's like, okay, well that sucks because I love what I'm doing and I want to put it out. But if people, if I'm not like what people are looking for, then I can't complain about it. Some people like what I'm doing. I just have to appreciate the people that appreciate me and just keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, and the, the, honestly, like the best advice I was ever given when I was a bit younger was from, uh, <laughs> from a group of jazz players that did uh, a demonstration in my high school. Uh, the drummer was running late from another gig because I guess they were just, they were doing a tour of like the local high schools in the area doing a music program about like jazz through the ages. And I'm not like a huge jazz head as much as I used to be because there's a, a lot of, you know, newer stuff out from younger players that's coming out and blowing my mind that, you know, I'm just rediscovering because I still have some friends that are, you know, very big in the jazz scene um, and, you know, pay attention to the current comings and goings. But like I, I grew up listening to the greats, you know, when I first started playing drums. So they do this high school program, my high school, dr the drummer who was the performing in this thing was running late from another gig. So the guitarist went to our band director and was like, hey, do you have a drummer that can read some charts? We need to get the program started. They put me up on stage, 14 years old. And I could read charts at the time because I started with piano and that gave me the basis for theory, insight, reading music, et cetera, et cetera. So I could stumble my way through some jazz charts at the time. And halfway through a 32 bar drum solo where I was scared shitless, the drummer walks into the wing of the stage and I see him and I, I knew exactly who this guy was, you know? So I'm naturally like, Oh, fangirl moment. I'm playing his drum kit, playing one of his songs, reading one of his charts. I really hope I don't fuck this up. And, you know, uh, the song was over. I'm shaking like a leaf in a tree. I go to give it, I walk, get off his drum kit. I walk up to him. I hand him a six. I say, you know, thanks for, thanks for letting me play your drum kit. He's like, sit back down. I want you to play his next song. I was like, all right. And, you know, <laughs> pro so I played another song with him and naturally that I got his okay. I was like, dude, living it up. I'm like, I'm feeling like a rock star, 14 years old, up in front of stage in front of my high school. And afterwards he said to me, he's like, I'll tell you one thing. And I hope you carry this with you. He was like, you focus on the money. The money's never going to come. He's like, you focus on the passion. And if it's meant to happen, it'll happen. If it doesn't, you put in the work. Sometimes it's just up for the fates to decide. Totally. 
you know, and so far I've been very fortunate to, you know, be able to have a career as a drummer. Cause you know, that's all I set out to do in the first place. You know, I had to rewrite a bucket list at 25 years old. Cause I had already done the things that I wanted to do, you know, so anything from here on out is extra. Uh, thanks for that quote, Peaky Blinders. <laughs> um, it's, and there's still so much that I want to achieve that I hope to achieve. You know, I'm not complacent. I'm not sitting still, or at least not, I don't want to be sitting still. Um, but, you know, as, as a content creator as well, just trying to, you know, fight for attention in a, a very digital age, you know, that's anytime I post a video to my Instagram, you know, just hoping that people, you know, comment on it and see that, you know, I'm trying to make some progress or, you know, trying to just put art out there. It's like, I hope people give a shit, you know, if they don't, they don't, that's, that's fine. You know, there's millions of other things for them to give their attention to, you know, I'm not benefiting anything be besides my own selfish, you know, self gratification from somebody, you know, smashing the like button or dropping a comment on one of my videos. And I graciously appreciate people taking the time out to, you know, say some kind words or offer, you know, constructive criticisms and stuff like that. But I understand that when I put content out, you know, I'm fighting against all of these things where there's, there's just so much out there for people to pay attention to, you know, and this is coming from somebody with ADHD. It's like, my mind is always pointed in 4 million directions mm -hmm. and I can barely formulate thoughts on a good day. Um, but I, you know, I, it, it's still, I, I would never tell somebody to not release something or to not, try to do something just because they're afraid it's not going to work yeah there somebody posted a quote on uh, uh i think it was somebody like snapped a f or snapped a screenshot or something from twitter uh i can't remember what the exact stats were but the director who did that that series queen's gambit about the chess player mm -hmm. i guess he pitched that to like a bunch of different film studios a bunch of different film studios and all the, all the film studios are like, nobody's going to watch a story about somebody playing chess. And then when it dropped, it was one of the most viewed things on the, any of the streaming platforms. Yeah. It was, it was like the number one stream. And it was just like kind of a testament to say like, just because a couple people don't believe in what you're doing doesn't mean you shouldn't at least give it an honest go if you believe in it. Yeah. You I know, I I think that's not that's something that that should ring true because what is art if it's not something you're passionate about just doing for the sake of doing it? Absolutely. I think that I've always been probably the thing that I'm most proud of when I self-reflect is just how selfish and unwilling to compromise I've been uh, to some degree. Just because it's like I've, I've always had this mindset where it's been look, you know, like if I'm going to get, you know, popular doing whatever the fuck it is that I'm doing, I just want it to be doing like being myself. That would be great. You know what I mean? If I get popular because of this facade that I've put on, then now I'm obligated to keep up this facade to maintain yeah. this life. And it's like, I don't want to do that. Who the fuck yeah. wants to do that? Yeah, man. Got to gotta be yourself. Sounds miserable. It does, man. You got you to be yourself and learn to love yourself too. Because that was like, that was a big thing this past year has brought on a lot of people. You know, a lot of people preach self-care, you know, mental health. Like these are things that have never really been widely addressed because people have always been afraid to talk about it. You know, like for initially, you know, catch me like a decade ago, you know, me admitting, you know, that to anyone, especially a digital world, you know, I was suffering from some sort of a form of depression, whether it's seasonal affective disorder, or I just woke up one day and really wasn't feeling myself. Like catch any of us 10 years ago, and nobody would have been comfortable having that conversation. You know, so if, if nothing else, I'm thankful that 2020 has given a lot of people the like, the solitude, not solitude, the solidarity that they needed to just be comfortable having those open conversations about important shit. And, and being, and realizing like, oh, a lot of us are in the same boat. Like we can comfortably talk about this stuff and know that like, I'm here for you. You're there for me. You know, whether we never talked about it before, it's like, yo, I love you brother. Or, you know, I love you sis. Like these are good people that even though there'd never been conversations about having each other's backs before, everybody's got your back and there's great support system out there for everyone. 
because there's a times, you know, even as an artist where we all go through a tough spot and, you know, they like this past year, I didn't feel really motivated to create a lot. You know, I wanted to learn some new skills, but there, there were days where like, I barely had the strength or the emotional fortitude to get out of bed. Yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of people dealt with that this year because there was, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot to do. Um, at least in, in some realms, you know, like at least in my head, you know, I didn't have a lot to look forward to, so to speak, because initially I was supposed to be on the road like five, six months this year. Yeah. And whenever that got pulled out from under me, I'm like, okay, all of this spare time, what the fuck do I do with my hands? <laughs> um, so I was like, well, I'm going to write a lo-fi chill beats EP. There's something. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to learn some motion graphics animation. There's something. Uh, okay, I'm going to learn a little bit more about photography since my, my wife has, has been trying so many times to teach me the ins and outs of like the relationship of shutter speed, ISO, F-stop, et cetera, et cetera. I'm starting to get the hang of it a little bit. I really don't have my own style as far as like photography or videography goes because yeah. these are all still new mediums to me that I'm still trying to explore a little bit and figure out what I like or what's like my thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. But in the meantime, I'll just keep making fun, weird 3d things and putting them on video and see what happens. Cause it's fun. And I, it brings me joy to do it. Absolutely. So what I'm going to do real quick, I'm going to swap the battery in my extra camera. And while I am up, the, the world can't see me. The world can only see you right now. Why don't you tell people where they can find that chill beats tape? And maybe talk about any other projects you're doing. This should maybe take me about 20 seconds. Heard that. I'm, I'm going to try and pull up the link on Spotify. Uh, so the project is called uh, East Coast Beat Machine, uh, known e dot, uh, e dot C dot B dot M. E dot M. The album's called Talk. Uh, that is Norwegian for thanks. Looks like this. I don't know if you can see it. No, my screen is being blacked out. Um, once this gets once this gets uh, uh, tagged on the social media, I'll attach a link to it. So the link to the Spotify and the the EP is you know up on all my socials. Um, it's good background music, good study music, chill vibes. Um, put out by my close pal. Eric Fain at uh, BLKC Records out in Kansas City. He's the best. Uh, he also has a little project called Barut, B A H R O O T. Uh, that's also some rad beats, good chill vibes. Um, just fellow dudes who like writing music for the sake of writing music and putting out content. Yeah. I'm back. So, welcome back. A thought that I had in terms of, you know, this, all of this new openness with um mental health and hey like i'm not feeling okay and talking about it i had a light bulb pop up in my head when we were talking about this and trying to figure out why has this become more of a common thing and it's like well if you think about pre social media our connections to each other were already pretty limited like we didn't really have these open ended conversations where we could like, you know, maybe put our feelings out in like a, a verbal form or write it out and share it with the world and get comments and likes from people. Right. It would just be, you'd have to be face to face with somebody to have these conversations. And that's a difficult thing to do to really get all of your feelings out there the right way when you're around yeah. people, especially if like, you know, maybe you're only seeing people, you know, once a week or once every other week or you're hanging out with your friends, you're probably trying to get away from those feelings, right? So you don't want oh, yeah. to talk about it. Then so escapism. Then social media happens and you know, we basically spent the past 15 years learning how to curate all the best parts of our lives and make ourselves look like we're rock stars, even though we aren't. Yeah. Well, some of us are. You're a rock star, yeah. but not all of us I are. Mean, <laughs> I don't know why I mean like yeah. but but also you know, taking the the bad with the good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, now I that's, think that's, I was going to say like now I think that like it's like, you know, we're finally getting to a point where we realize that like, oh, maybe like putting up this sort of a facade and pretending like everything is 100% great all the time for the sake of my Instagram isn't a good idea. And maybe I should be a little bit more open with people because I see other people being open. Maybe this is a, a healthy thing to do. We're finally it figuring is. it out. Yeah. It, I mean, it took a, it took a long ass time, you know, longer than uh, any of us really wanted it to. But uh -huh. I think the biggest thing is just like honesty to ourselves. Um, as far as like how we're feeling, you know, like that's, 
that affects everything, you know, especially as an, as adults, you know, like this past year was a, a lot of heartbreak and a lot of hardships for a lot of people, you know, that we lived through a very historical year, year that we, um, you know, f- found our way through it, but it was because of being able to be open and communicate with each other, you know, even in a digital, even in a digital world, you know, with, with things like zoom and, you know, FaceTime, Google hangouts or Google meet, I think it's now called, um, but with all this technology, being able to like reconnect to a little bit of humanity and humility. And I think those were two very, very important things and important lessons for a lot of people to relearn and revisit this year uh, was thinking about more than just yourself. And even, you know, like when you see a post on social media that says, you know, be sure to check in on your friends. You never really know how they're doing. And like that was a v- that's a very true thing. You know, like I have a, a lot of friends in healthcare uh, that work in healthcare. Uh, that initially when a lot of this virus stuff happened, a lot of people were more, more worried about, you know, their, our job, we were more worried about our jobs and, you know, ourselves and being like, oh, I wonder how my friend, rather than being like, oh, I wonder how my friends are doing. You know, it took a couple of weeks for us to get there. It took a couple of weeks of us stumbling through like, you know, our, like for me personally, it took me, you know, a couple of weeks of self-reflection and, um, you know, sitting with my feelings to like address like, oh my God, like, do I have a job anymore? Like, what does my future look like? You know, we had all these plans lined up for this year and then that rug got torn out from under me. So initially my thoughts on it were a very selfish thing, but then I realized there are so many people out there having a much more difficult time than me. So for me, I needed to like swallow my pride for a minute and check in on the people that I was worried about. You know? Yeah. Well, check, check, checking on my pals in healthcare, check in and my friends going to the protests, you know, like, being being there for the people that needed it much more than I did. Yeah, you know, but I I think that sometimes even if like those feelings may come from like you feel like they're coming from a selfish place, you know, I think it's really hard to be there for other people if you're not there for yourself. So I think it's important to yeah. make sure yeah. like okay, like I'm good. I know what I'm going to be doing. It's only natural to kind of maybe have this freak out like oh fuck, I don't know what I'm going to do, but also like if you're yeah brains in total chaos you're not going to be much help to other people that may need it so yin and yang so like yin and yang and reverse and rewind into you know like the conversation of like self-care and mental health like you have to look out for yourself you know because my my biggest problem uh for a long time was i would always try to be a band-aid before i could be my myself be a boulder Mm. You know, I was, I was always so, so much worried, so much more worried about other people and never really worried about myself. I was like, you know, I'll figure it out eventually. I'll deal with my, my shit later. How are you doing? How are you doing? You know, to, to the point where it was a fault or like when I actually had like a tough time mentally, I'm like, I don't know how to deal with my own feelings. Yeah. You know, I don't know how, I don't know how to deal with the own crux of my ADHD. You know, I don't know how to take all these feelings and thoughts and weird electrical firings in my brain and channel them into something fucking useful. You know what I mean? So like being able to, you know, this past year sit with myself and revisit what makes me, me, you know, be able to like relearn about myself again, you know, because I never really spent a lot of time doing that. You know, for me, it was just about taking in everything that I saw throughout my travels and, you know, living these experiences. It was never about like, how am I? mentally and emotionally how am i doing how am i feeling what's what am i feeling you know these were these are never things that i really had to like sit and think about at least for a long time um so this year like i'm thankful that you know i was able to learn about self-care and learn about like openly talking about mental health in a constructive way and learning to be a better listener you know rather than trying to like make a lot of conversations about myself, you know, that, that for me was a big lesson, you know, cause for me being a Leo and, you know, kind of being a little bit of a stubborn Italian and I have a tendency to like talk at people a lot. And sometimes I have a hard time shutting up and just learning to just sit back and listen and like, actually like really take it in and not try to relate my experiences to what somebody else is going through. You know, that's something that I will constantly be learning because you know, I'm 33. So a lot of, you know, my, uh, autopilot has been on for such a long time. So as long as I feel that I have that openness and willingness to learn and accept 
like a new thought process and be open-minded like we all should be and should have been from the get-go like that's the, i feel very very important part to like growing as humans and being able to be like better you know allies for our friends and our neighbors yeah i think that it's it's really interesting how you know i almost feel <laughs> as though like I'm going through this like growth in my brain again, like in the same way that when I was like, you know, 15, 16, 17, it's like, Oh, like I'm about to be, you know, technically an adult. And like, what is that future going to look like? And how am I going to interact and treat myself? It's like, okay, now it's like, now that I'm getting uh, inching towards 40, which I still have another half of a decade, but we're getting there. Nonetheless, it's like, fuck, like, you know, what is my life going to look like? You know, is it like, you know, should I still be focusing on all of these things that I'm focusing on? Am I happy? Am I actually happy? Am I not happy doing this stuff? Like, you know, what, what is this? Because I've been, like you said, I've been on autopilot for so long with working on all these music projects and all this art stuff. And it's just like, I don't know, like what it's like this balance on my head. Well, it's like, well, why can't I be a 40 year old still recording DIY rap songs in a second bedroom of my house? Why can't I'll, I do that? I'll, I'll still spin it. I but, mean, honestly. But, but like why? But like also it's like there's the part of me. It's like, well, did I somewhere? Did I fuck up somewhere? Like I, I have that like that self-doubt in my head. It's like, like, did I fuck up and make a wrong decision somewhere? I don't think I did, but I still feel like I need to ask myself that. And I don't know if that's healthy or not. No, I would say personally, I would say not healthy. I would say that it's better to learn to live with no regrets And if you feel the need to in the moment, then you just pivot. Yeah. And you just keep like, keep the progress because as long as you know, you're, you're progressing, um, how you feel you want to progress, it's more about your happiness and anything, because if you're not happy doing something, we're our own worst critics, cut the fat, trim that, that shit, get it out of your life. Because we're at that age now where it's like, if you're not happy doing something, just correct it. You can't wait on somebody else to make that decision for you. You just have to go for it, you know, and it, it can feel overwhelming and risky. And, you know, I 100% understand, you know, self-doubt, you know, like imposter syndrome is a real fucking thing. Um, but you just, you just got to follow what you, what you feel is the right thing to do. But if you're happy doing it, there's no fucking reason to stop. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's just kind of like that, like anything else you have good days and, bad days and oh yeah i just try to be very like open about any of these negative feelings that i have and just say them out loud and if i feel dumb about it later it's like well it's better that it's out instead of it just like building and you know creating all of this grossness in my brain yeah man you gotta let let the genie out of that bottle yeah yeah it's just i know it's a weird it's a weird thing it's a weird thing especially considering you know like for the longest time we always we're told, you know, like keep a lot of our thoughts to ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's a, like the, another big thing is like relearning how to be open, you know, how to communicate all over again. You know, I feel, I feel like we're, we're in social media preschool. <laughs> you know sure, what I mean? Sure. There's yeah. like, well, there's just like everything everything is new all the time yet it's all so familiar a lot of it's predictable um but it's still all new and i feel like that's that's why as artists we battle for we battle for attention is because everybody wants the newest shiniest thing Mm -hmm. you know so for somebody like me where it's like, you know, I put out what I think is like a cool lo-fi chill beats track, a young, a younger person who likes electronic music might listen. I'd be like, Oh, somebody already did that. And I like theirs better. And I just have to be like, that's fine. Yeah. Like I, I listen to that artist too. I think that's great. You know, I, uh, I want you to continue to support that artist because that's somebody that I look up to, or that's somebody that I also support. And my biggest thing that I want, you know, all bullshit aside, it's just, I just want to see good people doing what they love succeed. That's if I have one like dying wish, that's it. 
if you're if you're whole, like actually like a good person and you're you care about people around you you know you don't don't really have any ill will towards anyone for the most part of course but you're you're good at what you do you're passionate what you, what you do and you believe in what you do i want you to succeed that's all i just want i want you to be happy doing something you believe in whether you feel that it's going to make a big splash or not if you're happy doing it and you're a good person you deserve all the fucking success in the world because life is too short to not give it an honest go and at least have some good old fashioned fucking fun while we're doing it yeah yeah i i definitely try to keep that in mind and just think about like you know the the fact that i'm able to to do everything that i do on a daily basis is kind of ridiculous like Sometimes I, I feel like I do have a rather absurd life, like in the best way possible. It's just like the fact that, you know, like, like I have, you know, I, I play in bands with my best friends and, you know, I have a, a, you know, a cool job and a great girlfriend and a cool house and, you know, all this dumb tech that I could talk with my friends on the internet and stream it and stuff like this is cool. This is cool. You know, oh, yeah. it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's easy to always want more, you know, capitalism, oh, yeah. consumerism, Social Ooh, media, it. you get you get you get the Give bug, me. you get bit, you get bit by the by the bad stuff. Oh yeah, and that's a, that's an itch that never goes away. Mm -hmm. With you know, you know, one of the last things that I want to talk about before we wrap up, because we've been actually going for for quite a bit, but um, Woo. it's okay. I'm having a good time. There's people hanging out in the chat now because we're streaming accidentally. I didn't mean to. For anybody that came in later, this is streaming to Twitch accidentally because I hit the streaming button in OBS instead OBS, of the yeah. instead of the start recording, I hit start streaming and it's automatically linked to the Twitch. So but hey, you know what? This wasn't the worst idea in the world because maybe we gave some people a conversation. Joey Solex in the chat. So Joey Solex. <laughs> oh. The so so Joey was known known for the Solak experience. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into detail about what that's about, but he's he's known me since the beginnings of my drumming career. He knew me when I was a teenager, and like, you know, I I jacked his his hi hat pump and move. Okay, the hi hat pump move. Is yeah, Joey Sol. That's a Joey Solak original. <laughs> that that dude was one of the best at the, during that time that time frame like he was one of the most entertaining live drummers to watch in the metal scene period he was a fucking wild man and i love that dude so much <laughs> yo uh same same love 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 joey to death great great human being good soul fantastic Ugh. fantastic one of the last things that I, I want to talk about, uh, shout outs to DC Pratt in the chat, shout outs to Jason, shout outs to Joey, shout outs to Jake if you're still in the chat. There's a lot of people just kind of hanging out. I was surprised. This is cool. But the last thing I want to ask you is in regards to that time that you had spent in between Haste the Day and Prada, when you, know, you were doing the bartender thing, but you were also doing like, you know, another music project and you know working on things still like playing music but more on like a local level when yeah. it came to that that project that would have been what gypsy and his band of ghosts right yep, yep um yep. when it when it came to that project you know was that something that you had any intention of being like oh i want this to be like a touring thing or was it more of like a i just want to do this to do it and it's not really something i'm trying to make a big thing out of like what where was your mindset at that time it's kind of like hard to remember like what exactly was in my head back when that was taking place. But from what I can remember in the early iterances, I wanted to write and record a record by myself uh, and just release it. And I had just been writing these like folky, like Americana, whatever genre that would be considered songs on the road that uh, I had like a couple vocal ideas or just like lyrics and stuff that I wrote down on the road and then started messing around with get, like acoustic guitar licks and stuff. Once I got home and just record them on, you know, a little shitty little old computer mic that you plug into like an old PC you yeah. know, that just goes in a little boop, the little tiny one eighth yeah. uh, input. And I demoed them and I sent them to sent like a demo song to like a couple close pals of mine 
uh, who were fellow singer songwriters, just like get some input. Cause I'd never really written singer songwriter shit before. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Tell me if this is good or not. And they're like, uh, yeah, like this is really cool. Um, so I, I recorded just like a couple of just bedroom demos and a very close pal of mine, his name's uh, Caleb Pogiar, uh, who had been an active singer songwriter in Pittsburgh for a good couple of years. He was in a, we were in a bunch of uh, local bands together that would play, sh- play shows together back in Charleroi at the VFW uh, out in like Jeanette and all these stuff. Like I'm talking mid 2000, like yeah. early mid 2000 stuff. Yeah. And he was, he was having a record release show at uh, I think the venue was called the viaduct. I think it was like somewhere in Oakland or something. This okay. would have been uh, 2011, 2011. I remember it's Jan. Wow. I'm having like really like intense <laughs> flashback memory now, January 14th, 2011 at the viaduct or the aqueduct or something. Okay. He was having his record release party for, I think uh, the, his, the band name back then was called signal to the ocean estate. Um, And it was very like very Wilco esque, like early Jeff Tweedy kind of stuff. Um, But he was such a phenomenal uh, guitarist and songwriter, a very close pal um, uh, that I got to know over the years, just from having like a very tight knit circle of pals. And he said, "Dude, you know, I'm having this record release show, and I really like your demos. Like, if you can, if you want to put together a full band, I'd love to have you come play this show." So I recruited my pal. Diego, uh, B- Diego Burns, now Diego Burns Damicelli, um, who I met in 2005 uh, when I was living with the Once Nothing Boys out in Robinson. I recorded, or I recruited him uh, to play lead guitar because he's also a phenomenal fucking songwriter and all around musician and dude and one of my rider dies. Love you, Diego. Uh, and then reco- recruited one of my best friends, uh, Scott Maniglia, to play drums. And another one of my best friends, Tony Tortella, to play bass. And ends up, all these dudes can sing. Because like the biggest thing that I wanted to do with this project is I just, I envisioned it having a lot of like those very rich vocal harmonies reminiscent of like the 1970s shit. All the dudes around one mic and like a live setting, just like whiskey drinking, foot stomping, good times. Yeah. That was what, that was what I envisioned. Because we, when we would all hang out, we would have bonfires back in my parents' Uh, farm in the south hills literally doing that drinking around a bonfire you know sitting around like c- playing cover songs with each other and just hanging out and enjoying the the finer moments in life so i wanted to kind of capture that vibe with it with this band gypsy and his band of ghosts so in the early utterances i think it was more just about having that sense of camaraderie and releasing that music and doing this stepping well outside of my comfort zone because i'm no front man I, like i don't look at myself as a front man i'd never been a front man before i didn't know what it took um eventually you know gypsy kind of dissolved just because i under i finally understood what it took to like run up diy project like that and it became very difficult like i wasn't good at it i wasn't good at you know the organization of like scheduling to get rehearsals together with everybody uh like booking shows I was I just wasn't organized enough to do it on my own. And all the like all the guys had these other passions and stuff that they wanted to do as well. So like eventually that's why I kind of dissolved because like these guys are some of my best friends still to this day. Like my my fucking rider dies and watching them all do these things that they love and kill it, like that to me is the best success that I can see because I'm watching good people do what they believe in. Not to mention like some of my fucking brothers. Uh but in regards to like what my thoughts were when it first started, when it first started, it was just simply for fun. We wanted to, I wanted to release a record with my friends. We did that. Uh, and then Josh Bakaitis uh, from Drusky, formerly Drusky, um, he actually like took us on under his wing because like he and a couple, a couple guys from like that, uh, that era like really believed in what we were doing like the stuff that we were doing so like they really started to try and push it you know we had we talked about you know maybe doing like a couple little weekend runs and stuff like that never really came to fruition just because like the sheer magnitude of what that would have meant like it was a large undertaking for for me personally to be like the front man of this band and like i think i kind of got cold feet a little bit Mm. because i'm like 
I don't know if I'm ready for that like responsibility. Cause like, I just initially started this for fun and like, I want people to care about the songs that I write. And I want people to be able to relate to them, but like, it, I think it kind of, kind of spooked me and scared me away a little bit just because I knew that I knew I wasn't a front man. You know, I was just kind of like faking it. I'm like, I'm having fun. I'm having fun doing this because I'm doing it with some of my best friends. And these are songs that I just wrote in my bedroom or like in the back of a fucking 15 passenger van somewhere in a Walmart parking lot in like sure. Iowa circa 2003. So I just wanted to do it to give it an honest go. And by the time we, hu- we hung it up, um, it, we never really like hung it up, hung it up. It just kind of dissolved. Like it's still kind of out there in the ether. And I still have, you know, a couple songs on my hard drive that are unreleased um, that are just demos where like, I've, I've always been talking to the guys, like we're going to get back to finishing these and we're going to release them <laughs> or heaven help me. It's going to get done. And I'll, I'll get to that eventually. Uh, I think for me, it was just re- trying to revisit mentally how I felt in January, 2011, when I first started playing shows as a front man and trying to like reinvigorate that passion and that energy that I had for it. Cause I think b- hiding behind my drum kit for so long, it just kind of, s- kind of scared me away from being in front of a microphone. I'm like, I, I really don't like the sound of my own voice. You know, I'm a smaller dude. So naturally my voice is a bit of a higher timber. Um, you know, my, my mom always loved my stuff, you know, and my father-in-law and my, my mom, my mom-in-law and my wife have always like loved the music that I'd put out, but we're all our own worst critics. And I'm like, Ooh, when I hear myself recorded, I'm like, I don't know, man, that doesn't sound like me. That doesn't sound like me. I sound weird for sure. But yeah, I, I'll eventually get back to put, putting some of that stuff out just for the, sh- the sheer fact of it being fun. Cause I had a lot of fun, you know, writing the music with the the guys and putting that stuff out. But Baby steps. Yeah, it's it's interesting just how completely different it is. You know, just being a different in a different position of the band, just going from like you know being a drummer that kind of is playing in a touring band that has a booking agent and all of this stuff, where it's kind of like show up, rehearse, do your thing, and it's like, hey, cool, I can manage this. But then all of a sudden, it's like you got to do all of the the email and the booking and organizing all of the practices on top of writing the songs and then also oh, yeah. practicing and showing up. It can be a lot. And I think that, you know, the thing that it seemed like what you ended up gravitating towards is just like, this is more of just something for me to keep, to just keep the wheels turning in my brain and to have fun with my friends. And I yep. think that a lot of people sometimes overlook the value in that, especially on like a local level. Like it's okay to just be in a band with your friends as long as you and everybody else is having fun. It doesn't have to be this big thing. Yeah. It's that kind of boils, boils down to like a conversation uh, that went around social media. I think like earlier in 2020 about like having a, having a passion and a hobby versus having to monetize that passion or hobby. It's like, it is healthy. It's so healthy to just have hobbies. You don't have, as an artist, you don't have to monetize everything. I know a lot of the times as artists, it feels like we do because we're not always bringing in a shit ton of money, but you have to have some things that you just do for fun because you enjoy it. Like for me, I love, 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 love riding my motorcycle. If I didn't have a motorcycle, like this year would have been looked a lot different for me because, you know, I found some some very close pals at a local garage in Uptown called Uptown uh, Metalworks that took me under their wing and, you know, let me ride with them and taught me about vintage motorcycles. And, you know, we went on a couple like day trips together. We, we rode our bikes all the way up to, to Maine back in August. Wow. Um, so like that would, for me, is just like a passion and like just a good fun sense of freedom and a really fun hobby to like learn to wrench on the bikes a little bit, you know, learn a little bit how the, ins- like the motors work, how to, you know, how to fix some things when they break. Still not all the way where I want to be as far as my knowledge with the vintage bikes, but I'm getting there with due diligence. Um, but yeah, like you don't, you, you have to have hobbies, you know, for me, blender and like 3d motion graphics animation, that's a hobby an unhealthy one for, for me whenever I, whenever I first started learning about it because of, you know, how many YouTube tutorials I had to watch just to be able to do stuff like this, like make this, the lasers and stuff animate on this little cube or like go to the camera track and go through this tunnel. Um, but there was a dude I followed on uh, YouTube. His name uh, goes by Ducky3D where he works 
in Blender, like that's his primary software he uses and does this stuff at a professional level. So like if his YouTube channel didn't exist, I wouldn't know how to do half of this shit. Yeah. Um, but that for me, like Blender's just Blender and 3D motion graphics animation is a hobby, you know, and I'm okay with not monetizing it right now because, you know, I'm still learning about it. I'm having fun learning. Mm-hmm. Um, but having, having the healthy balance and understanding the limits, I think is important to, you know, having those hobbies. Yeah. I think that it's, it's, it's really super interesting for me to always have these conversations with people, especially musicians that are operating on a more professional level of just like, what is it like when like, you know, your main hobby, like your big thing, your passion playing drums. Now all of a sudden this has become like a career, you know, it's, it's elevated up. So now it's like, fuck, like what happens when, you know, the thing that you love the most becomes the thing that you need to survive in some ways. Like that's a really, really interesting and scary thing to think about. It is. I think the important thing to remember though, is that it's fleeting the the career part of it's fleeting and to not, not lose the passion for it. Because like for me, you know, I really neglected the use of my rehearsal space in 2020 because I just didn't have like the motivation or the energy to go. You know, and like I was, there were good part, good parts, the, the better parts of 2020 where I was just sad, man. Like I was just, I was really sad, you know, like I wanted to be playing music and I wasn't playing music. I wanted to see my bandmates and I couldn't see my bandmates. You know, I wanted to be on stage in front of people and I couldn't, you know, and uh, it was just this past Friday was the first time in shit months you know since prada got together to do like the the video stream stuff in kansas city it had been months since i'd been at my rehearsal space behind my drum kit you know and just literally sitting down at my drum kit for i think it was there for like three hours just sitting down just to like play whatever the fuck came to mind i felt like i was 16 years old (laughs) all over again learning how to play blink 182 songs yeah it like it just invoked this like nostalgia where i was just like euphoric i was so fucking happy like and i forgot about that and it was literally a 15 minute drive down the road for me you know i got i'm at the 448 studios okay and i'm like this has been there the whole time and i just been neglecting it because you know like I didn't think that it would do it for me. I didn't think, you know, getting back behind my drum kit would be good for me mentally. Cause I'm like, I can't do anything with it. I can't, I can only get behind my drums and just beat on them. It's like, what is that going to do for me? Mm -hmm. And then I just said, fuck it. And I went and I did it again. I'm like, I feel, I feel renewed. Yeah. It goes back to the self care sort of talk we were having. And I think that sometimes, you know, when it comes to like these productive things, like whether it's rehearsing or working on a, a mix or something. I have to feel like if there's no purpose for me to do it, I don't want to put time into it. But in it it, with the self care thing, it's really easy to neglect that. Maybe the purpose is just self care. The purpose is like, this is good for your spirit to just sit down and do this thing that you love and connect with this instrument and like have a conversation with yourself that isn't in your head, but a conversation that you're having musically with yourself through your instrument. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I was, so like I posted a little, I think it was like a 44 second clip on the 1st of January, a couple of days ago of just like the first groove that I like sat down and played and I'm looking, I'm watching my face in the video and it just takes me back to that feeling. I'm like what I was feeling in that moment when I played that simple groove and I'm like that, that's a, that's a guy right there in that video that feels happy and feels fulfilled for the most simple little thing like getting behind his drum kit, just to play a little beat. Yeah. You know, it didn't have, didn't have to be on stage in front of hundreds of people. It didn't have to be in a recording studio track, tape track a record. Like it just took that little 44, 45 second groove for me to just remember like, Oh, like there is a lot of happiness and little things. We just have to know where to look. Absolutely. Well, I think that we have been going for quite a quite a while. I've had Shocking a good time along. talking with you. I could probably talk with you for another hour and a half. But oh, yeah. but you know, I think that you know, the the rock star thing to say would be you always want to leave them wanting more. So <laughs> so uh I think that 
we'll probably wrap this up now. Uh, it was good seeing you, albeit through a computer screen, but good seeing you. You as well, man. You as well. You have a you have a virtual show coming up soon too, right? Yeah, yeah. On the the eighteenth, the eighth, the eighth, January eighth, next Friday. Oh, yes. baby, coming up. It's a it's the the normal creatures album release fake stream. Yeah, we're not I, calling I it that. a live stream. It's a fake stream because it's already been filmed and edited. It's like a fully produced thing because like. I don't know. I, I'm a maniac, much like yourself in terms of these things. It's like, I have fucking four cameras, four nice cameras laying around the house. I'm going to multi-cam this. And yeah. also, since it was like, we didn't, you can't have a crew or anybody come in and help. So literally, we shot it pretty much ourselves. Like, my girlfriend helped with one pass on a handheld camera, and the rest, like, we did, like, all performance stuff, then played through the sets again, and, like, you know, me and Mandy filmed Evan and Justin, and they filmed us, and then it got edited all together. Like, I edited the whole thing to make it look, like, all seamless and shit. I basically turned my basement into a venue, like, all of the DMX lights and the projector and everything, like, just really went all out, because, uh, why not? Yeah, dude, I'm, can't, I can't go anywhere. Can't have a crew. I have all the shit. Let's just make it happen. Yeah, I saw, I saw the Facebook event, so I will be there. Please, please tune in. I we're will gonna be there for sure. I think that uh, we're all gonna be in the live chat as well. I think we're probably gonna do something similar to what me and you are doing now, but with the whole band beforehand, just kind of like a hangout Q and A sort of thing, and then fucking play the thing, and then people can hear the album and see the new live show. Cause I did. I programmed a whole new live show uh, in this time that we had off because nothing else to do. Which is which was right. simultaneously great, but simultaneously depressing because I have no idea when people are actually going to be able to see this. But at least we got a good filming of it. So there's that. There, there you go. There you yeah. go. We get to wit- get to witness it firsthand here. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. What's, uh, what software do you build all that stuff in? So I do uh, right now. Well, the. Uh, all of the video stuff that I'm doing now is just edited in Premiere. I'm just using Adobe Premiere because it's a lot more just like camera clip stuff. It's not so much like graphic Mapping. shit. Yeah. But then all of the um all of the DMX stuff now because we have like a full light setup. That's all MIDI controlled, and I'm actually using Reaper. And Reaper's running our whole live set. Like I'm running our live video, all of our lights, and all of our backtracks through Reaper. Cause we also so do, sick. we also do like, um, like multiple backtracks out. It's not just a stereo line. Like it's like a synth line, drums, backing vocals, backing guitars, all like, you know, I have like eight XLR outputs for our so, backtracks. So basically what you're saying on a professional level is if somebody needs a playback tech, they need to hire you. Yeah, I could do that. I mean, I'd rather yeah. do it for myself, but I could do it. I could help yeah. you out. I'm good. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, I, 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 know, I know how to do all that stuff. That's that's the cool thing about having those cards in that deck, man. There's probably somebody who's pine, pining to have yeah. a guy like you on their crew that's just waiting to find that guy. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like all uh like all ego aside, the position of put myself in, I don't think there's too much that I don't know how to do from like operating on this DIY level for the past 15 years. Like I've never had anybody that really wanted to help me with anything so i've just had to figure it out and now i have all of these skills but like i don't know it drives me crazy sometimes oh yeah you got <laughs> you got the you got the briefcase full of the tools yeah, yeah. no doubt all righty man well, well hey Jan- yo. january january 8th on facebook january 8th on facebook for anybody that's there. watching or listening to this in the future uh i think it should still be available on our facebook i can't see myself deleting it it'll be there so you could go back and watch it but uh yeah dude Thank you so much, Giuseppe, for taking the time. And uh, should I do an outro? I'm going to do my outro. Let's do it. Beat it all. And that is all, folks. Thanks so much for being here one more time. Giuseppe, you're my dude. Thank you so much. I'll be back again next week with another episode. But before then, with some other bullshit, who knows? I'll be around. You follow me on the internet. You'll see me pop up. But yes, I'll be back at some point in time. Same time, same place, same channel. That's the complete opposite of what I just said. Fuck it. Uh, You know the drill. My name is Sykes. Start the beat. 2021. First episode of the new year. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for listening. And we are done. I'm going to fade this beat out. I'm going to stop streaming. Goodbye to Twitch. Even though it was an accident again.
fuck it. People were there, so it worked.